let's get started. Welcome uh, uh, to day two of the uh, Tony Potassi extravaganza and birthday celebration. Uh, uh, the first speaker today will be uh, Sam Bus. Uh, go ahead, Sam. Thanks. Thank you for coming on this rainy day, especially because you could have stayed at home with a cup of coffee and streamed me. Uh, yeah, so it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Uh, great honor to speak for Tony, who it's hard to believe we were all reaching these ages of round numbers. Um, I'm, I'm past these ages, so that's okay. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd talk about extended Frege proofs because that's something Tony and I worked on together. And I thought, oh, we don't know much about extended Frege proofs. I can easily mention all results we know about extended Frege proofs in 30 minutes and stop early. And then I got into it. I realized we actually know quite a bit about extended Frege proofs. So what that means is I have a lot of slides. So if you don't want me to go too fast, ask questions. I promise to at least put every slide on the screen for a couple seconds. So then you can go home and, screen, and see what I would have said had I had time. <laughs> so ask questions. Um, I can make the slides available too. And I'll correct them before I put them on my webpage too. <laughs> Which may, okay, well, no, I, I do that. I'm good about that stuff. <laughs> so, um, and I, as I said, you know, we're all reaching this age, and I reached it some five years ago. I turned 60, and Tony spoke for an event for me then. And on a similar topic, in fact, she also thought, well, what have I worked on jointly with Sam? And strangely, it's the same thing I've worked on jointly with her. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had a lot of overlap in the talk, and she very kindly sent me your slides. I was thinking, oh, I can just reuse your slides. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, okay, so I, I didn't, but you know what I, what I remembered most about her slides before she sent them to me was a couple pictures. So the first one was, was this one, which I remember being befuddled at, and then somebody <laughs> explained that it was a deer caught in the headlights of a car like you're at, the, <laughs> at a talk about your own 60th birthday. And I hope Tony doesn't feel this way, but you did a good job of, of matching how I spelled down. So, okay, so there's... <laughs> That was you. Okay, I wasn't sure. Oh, that was you. Well, it's me now. <laughs> okay, I thought it was me then too. So, a... oh, oh, I see. It's a different. So she was making the point, I guess, that she when she was studying with Steve, that she had the big learning experience, I guess, of all these things to learn, like all of us have to learn. So, anyway. Then I I didn't steal any Tony slides, but Dimitri and Anastasia very kindly let me one of their nice ticks pictures, which I modified slightly. Here's a bunch of systems that were on their slides. And what I'm going to say is, in particular, I'm going to talk about extended Frege, which is not on this slide. But if you look, now it is. Okay. <laughs> and so it sits up there. And um, this, so this talk is this part up there with the red part around the extended Frege. And I just thought, well, I'm just talking about a little bit of Tony's work, because everywhere there's a red exclamation mark. Tony's done really deep, important work. So I could have talked about any of these topics and I hope other people, and plus there's all the stuff she's done that isn't on these pictures at all. So there's lots of things one could talk about, but at any rate, I'm doing extended figure today. So let's go for it. Uh, just to remind you, I think everyone knows this stuff <coughs> in the audience, but if not, you're welcome to ask questions. Um, Frager proofs are the usual textbook proof system for propositional logic. We're proving things about Boolean formulas, variables range over true, false. We have connectives like and, or, not, if, and, if, then, and so forth. And we can formulate it with just modus ponens as the only rule of inference. Extended Frege proofs introduce the extension rule, which lets you introduce an abbreviation using a new variable P for any formula that you wish, right? Okay, well, shouldn't involve P for instance, but okay. And so, in effect, lines in an extended Frege proof can be viewed as Boolean circuits as compared to lines in a Frege proof viewed as Boolean formulas. So we're reasoning with Boolean circuits. So we want to look at the proof complexity of extended Frege proofs. So let's start from the beginning here. Yes, question? One slide back. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, uh, isn't it so that extended Frege simulates all proof systems for which we have lower bounds? So, oh, um, actually, yes. I, I meant to put some more arrows on here, which I guess is my first correction on my slides or something like that. But I, um, just say it. It's so oh, okay. So I think extended Frege simulates 
all of these systems, I guess, including SOS, they're, they're blowing on this thing. And it simulates all screw systems you have bound, more bounds for, as far as I know. But it definitely simulates all these things that are lower than it on the slide. Okay. Good. So I can add some arrows later on. So, so the, going back to the very beginning, uh, extended frame was introduced in the form of extended resolution. Oh, geez, what's wrong there? Slides are falling off the bottom. Um, extended resolution by Satan in a 1966 St. Petersburg seminar. Um, and he had the re the resolution rule, which in the English translation of his paper is called the annihilation rule and the extension rule. And he gave exponential or balance on tree-like resolution and regular re re resolution using what we now call the Titan principle, but for grid graphs. So these are rectangularly arranged points in the plane. Okay, good. So that was the start, actually a pretty strong start, I must say. Okay, right. So good. And then, uh, then the sort of the heyday, the glory days of extended rep resolution, perhaps, were those uh, Steve Cook and Robert Reckow and also Rick, also Rick, Rick Statman proved a whole bunch of stuff about extended Frega. So first of all, this is where they formulate in terms of the extension rule with Frega proofs instead of resolution proofs. There's equivalent in strength, but now we allow connectives and or not if then. I believe that was original, this group. Um, if someone knows otherwise, please let me know. Uh, we heard already about the Cook program, if that's what it was, for proving P not equal to MP. Uh, sorry, NP not equal to co MP. Um, uh, uh, Reckow and his thesis gave the very detailed proof for Frege, but not so, so hard proof for extended Frege that it doesn't matter what propositional logic language you use. So we might as well use and or not. And if, if then, there was the development of the PV equational theory of bounded arithmetic and the provably total universal formulas in this language have polynomial size extended Frege proofs and uh, PV proves the consistency of extended Frege and this is the strongest system which PV proves consistency of. Um, and then there is the characterization of the proof size measured in number of symbols for extended Frege proofs is polynomially related to the number of proof lines in a Frege proof. So basically the idea is just if you unwound all those definitions inherent in the extension rule, the number of lines would be bounded in a Frege proof would be bounded by the, the size of the extended Frege proof. And conversely, you only if you have a Frege proof with humongous lines, you could just introduce abbreviations for the subformulas, everything present, and you get an extended Frege proof with short formulas. And maybe most famously for the uh, theorem proving group here, and many, many lower bounds, polynomial size proofs of a pigeon principle. So that was, that's that. Um, like I said, questions are welcome. If not, I'll just make it through the whole talk in time. Was that? Yes, but that was uh, six, 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 seven years later. Okay, I'll come up on a later slide. Yeah, that, that was my theory. But yes, come up six or seven years later. <laughs> Okay, so yes, but so there's also polynomial size groups in Frege with a different proof and that's sort of relevant, right? Okay, so so jumping forward a little bit in time, just because this is a, supposed to be a conference for Tony's birthday here, but not just because it's also a beautiful result. Uh, Tony and Alistair Ur Urquhart introduced or just studied the, uh, the highest calculus, which we've heard a little bit about already, was already an ex existing system, a proof system, as it were, uh, for a non-deterministic procedure for generating uh, graphs which are not three colorable. And it generalizes to other values of, of three, uh, K greater than three, <laughs> right. But, but here it is for three. There's the following rules. Uh, the complete graph on four vertices is not three colorable. And there's a join rule. And the join rule, let me see if I can do this somehow. Oh, I see. Here we go. Um, so the join rule here, you start with two graphs, G1 and G2, and they have an edge, which I've drawn red and blue there, and another one that's red and orange, uh, sorry, blue and red here, I guess, I did, and then blue and orange here. And then you amalgamate them by identifying the, the blue vertices, which don't have to have the same colors. I'm just doing that for pictorial things, and putting a, a triangle between the three vertices when you join them together. 
So that's a join rule. And the idea being that if G1 and G2 are both three colorable, then this amalgamated G1 and G2 is three, 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 three colorable. And the contraction rule isn't implicationally sound, but unless you take uh, a graph of two distinct vertices and identify nodes in them. Okay. I, really should have, I read this paper somewhat to prepare this talk, but I, I think I should go back and read it more carefully to really understand all this stuff again. Right, it's been a few years. And uh, in particular, if you drop rule three, you still have an implicationally sound and complete system, but possibly rule three helps. In fact, very possibly rule three helps. And so, so the open question had been, uh, an open, outstanding open question was what's the sh shortest length or what's an upper bound on the length of highest calculus proof? So three, col three colorability in the worst case. And so Tony and Alistair showed of, not, of non three colorability, yes. So, Tony and Alistair showed that in fact, the highest calculus is polynomial equivalent to extended Frege. Uh, and they did this for tautologies that encode appropriately the non free colorability uh, graphs, right? And if you looked at the, the highest calculus without that, uh, that uh, contraction rule, that's implicationally <laughs> complete and is piece simulated by depth five Frege proofs. Okay, so that was two nice results. In particular, as a corollary, that latter system requires exponential size derivations in the worst case because of results due to Tony and a bunch of other people, starting with Itai, who always seems to come first, we've heard <laughs> that, um, that there's exponential lower bounds on constant depth Frege proofs for a lot of things. And uh, another follow up result there was that um, the tree like Hyos calculus proof requires exponential size. Beautiful system. One so, sort of wonders if this could somehow be relevant for the modern CDCL DRAT style things, because it's sort of similar for proving tautologies on graphs, but I don't know. Okay. So the highest calculus proofs use the fact that the zero one substitution rule is surprisingly powerful. So if you start with the regular proof system with just modus ponens, not the extension rule, and you allow very simple sub substitution rules, you can replace a variable by a constant, uh, then that's equivalent to extended Frege. And I think that was a homework problem in my, my Berkeley lecture notes, uh, presented without proof. And I, I think the way this worked, Tony can correct me, Alistair e emailed me, said, can we use this result? And oh, by the way, what's the proof? <laughs> <laughs> So it was, I guess, a you know, suitably hard homework problem. But anyway, there were a lot of substitution results already known. Um, let me get this. Um, so in particular, the substitution rule was introduced by Cook and Reckow, uh, or actually introduced by Rega himself back in the 19th century in a, a stronger setting. Uh, and it was shown equivalent to the substitution Frege. You take Frege plus the substitution rule for general formulas. This was shown equivalent to extended Frege by uh, one direction was shown by uh, Hook and Reckow, and the harder direction was proved separately by Martin Dow and Young Prychek and Pavel Pudlock. Right. And then zero one substitution rule and variable substitution rule, um, I think, showed up in my homework problems at Berkeley, eventually showed up in a paper. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Uh, one open question here is does Variable substitution, as I defined it, allows identifying variables. So you could you could have a, a formula with x and y, and it is two two variables, and substitute x for y, thus identifying the, the two variables. If you don't allow identifying variables, it's variable permutation. We don't know whether that added to Frege control or not. Like the symmetry mechanisms, the symmetry mechanisms are not Yes, yeah, so that's something. Yeah, much maybe that's sort of it. Yeah, it's not no. This is. I'm not sure how that relates to symmetry break rules. That's a good question. But actually, there's a more fundamental question here to, to move on to the next topic. Does the Frege proof system all by itself simulate extended Frege? And so uh, Tony was, uh, as we heard already, spent three years, I guess it was, in San Diego as a postdoc, uh, with which she and Rich were there. After a year or two, Ella as well was there, and and uh, but one of the things we worked on uh, with with Maria and Tony and I was the lack of plausible combinatorial examples separating Frege from extended Frege, 
right? We have, you know, it's just a strange thing. You take P versus NP, we have tons of NP complete things that could plausibly separate P and NP. And we just don't have much of this for Frege versus extended Frege. And so it's known that in particular, the consistency statements for extended Frege, these are propositional formulas that express the finitary partial consistency statement of extended Frege. Those have short extended Frege proofs that was due to Steve and they're complete for the consequences of extended Frege in the sense that if a Frege proof system theory or, or weaker proof systems prove these things in polynomial size, then it P simulates extended Frege. But this seems like a, a cheat, right? And so what about combinatorial <coughs> examples? And we looked at a bunch of these things. First of all, there were a couple already known. The pigeonhole principle was already known to have poly polynomial size proofs in both Frege and extended Frege. And likewise, the Ramsey theorem was known to be due to Pavel. Uh, have po po polynomial size in Frege. And then I think Tony really did the work for a lot of this paper here. She went out and asked a bunch of people, can you give me examples of theorems that should be easy in extended Frege and hard for Frege? And I don't know how all these people knew what these things were, but they kind of had a bunch of great examples. And uh, we credit them in a paper, but we didn't put any of them on as co-authors. So, <laughs> But uh, the odd town theorem, Graham Pollock theorem, well, you see all the things in blue. I might highlight especially the A, B equals I, implies BA equals I. These are for square zero one matrices. Uh, uh, was actually didn't show up in our paper. This came later from Steve Cook. So these were all these linear algebra based uh, things where the, the obvious proofs or the not so obvious proofs have linear algebra in them, right? Um, and then there are a few things that are combinatorial. Frankel's theorem, I put in red because it was exactly the kind of thing we're looking for. We, if we had polynomial size, extended Frege proofs, we couldn't make polynomial size Frege proofs. So thus it was at the time a candidate for separating the two systems. And other ones like Bondi's and cross Gutona, we, we started them with the candidates, but then they turned out we found polynomial size Frege proofs. So they weren't candidates anymore. And other people suggested other things, uh, knazer uh version of the Tucker Lemma, local improvement principles came out of studies and balanced arithmetic. These also generated examples, right? in the interest of time, I'm not gonna mention them, but they are. So the outcome was possibly disappointed, disappointing is that all the linear algebra things have quasi polynomial size Frege proofs to start off with. So this was due to uh, Rubis and Samaret building on earlier work of Samaret with Cook. Um, Frankel's theorem, uh, James Eisenberg, a student of mine and uh, Maria, um, Typo there, but at any rate, I don't know what that little thing is doing. I'll fix that later. Has polynomial size Frege proofs. Uh, Knazer, Lovash, and Tucker, likewise. And most of local improvement principles fell either firmly in the Frege camp or not seeming to have extended Frege proofs at all. There's a few cases left, but basically we covered nearly everything that we know, right? I mean, so, and the other thing was coming back to the pigeonhole principle, this is one of our starting points, was that one of the reasons we believe Frege is different than extended Frege was that the Steve and Robert Reckow's proof of the pigeonhole principle didn't work in Frege. It was very special to, to extended Frege. But then I was able to prove not too long ago that in fact, if you take their original proof, it can be recast as a Frege proof, that same construction with quasi polynomial size proofs. So again, we have this sort of quasi-polynomial se se separation is the best we can concretely give. Um, so summary here, A, we believe extended Frege should be stronger than Frege, but we lack good examples. And B, I spent a fair amount of time trying to show that Frege could quasi-polynomially simulate extended Frege all without success, so yes. Is there any known something like, you know, if you, if you prove this, then he is not in a C. Is it, oh, yeah, that's a perfect question. I didn't ask this, it's not in the slides also. So one might say, is there some connection between the question of whether Boolean formulas pol polynomially simulate Boolean circuits and the question of whether Frege is the same as extended Frege? We don't have any such implication either way. It could be that formulas capture the strength of circuits, but that can't be proved in a Frege system. And so you don't get the simulation. And conversely, it could be that, you know, extended Frege proofs could be simulated or quasi polynomially simulated by Frege proofs with, by some mechanism other than uh, 
translating circuits to form formulas. How about it intuitively? Like when you <laughs> intuitively, that's our motivation is that somehow formulas are, we think, less expressive than polynomial sized circuits. And so that you should be able to reason with more concepts and thus prove more things. But it's just a wishful thinking. Sorry, well, so while we're asking about examples, um, what about the truth table formulas? Are those not combinatorial enough to be good candidate separating principles? Well, oh, good point. I actually, good point. Truth table formulas weren't on my, so the question was what about separating with truth table formulas? Um, that was not on my radar, and I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, maybe someone else will comment on that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So they're hard for everything. They're just hard for everything. Yeah, question that's easy for a center break and hard for Prega. Like I'm not I'm not aware of any truth table formulas to do that, but I haven't really thought about it. I think Tony agrees with me. It's not good. Yeah. Yes, okay. Tony agrees with me. Okay. Okay. I think that's my favorite something like that as a projection example, but not to separate the two. Just that we I don't know the history. I have a feeling it was first done by uh, which of the papers, Krychek or. Mm -hmm. I think that they are very really hard for any proof system. So yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. These things, so these things tend to be hard for any proof system. Is the idea. So to go very quickly because I'm hitting a little bit towards the end of time. Uh, still have some time though. So Jan showed Jan. Jan uh, Krychek showed that tree-like extended Frege is polynomially equivalent to non-tree-like extended Frege. Uh, Neil Toppin mentioned in his talk uh, recently that tree like there's a tree like sequent calculus G1 with quantified propositional logic involving only existentially quantified formulas, and that's equivalent to extended Frege. Uh, and that, by the way, has very close connections to the bounded arithmetic theory S12. Okay. And so I'm going to move on. Uh, Jeremy Avigod gave an interesting uh, result that. He has some plausibly hard combinatorial tautologies, T, which are equivalent to the consistency of extended Frege proofs. So um, I don't believe anyone's ever been able to follow up on this with further results, but it's, it's an interesting <coughs> result and maybe deserves being looked at again. Um, again, I haven't looked at these in quite a few years, but they're based on tautologies about hereditarily finite sets. Um, moving along, then we have maybe more relevant for what I wanted to cover here, two conditional hardness results. So Krychek and Pudlock show that if the, the crypto system RSA is computationally secure, then extended Frege does not have feasible interpolation. People talk about interpolation. I think Maria will talk about interpolation more tomorrow. So I'll let her take this subject on. Uh, also, she and uh, Tony and Ron, Ron Ross extended this to integer factorization being hard. And that assumption, uh, systems such as Frege and TC0 Frege, that's a counting version of Frege, also don't have feasible interpolation. And there's a, another result that also applies to AC0 Frege as well. I'm not sure we'll hear more about that tomorrow. So these kind of results block some of our known lower bounds <coughs> methods, I should have said. They're not lower bounds, lower bound methods, right? Uh, another result which Tony was also involved was, uh, so this was with uh, Olekovich, myself, Moran, and Tony, is if P is not equal to NP, there's no polynomial time algorithm that approximates the length of the shortest proof in the proof system Q to within a factor of two to the log n to one minus epsilon. It's a factor of that, you know, and so where Q can be, it's not really a theorem about extended Frege, but I still put it in because it does apply to extended Frege because Q can be any of these systems I've listed here, including rather weak systems like res resolution. Right. So, so that's another thing akin to inter in, interpolation. Um, then there's, I think, again, I think this will be covered a lot, has been covered already in a couple of talks. Jakob talked about it earlier for cutting planes. I expect we'll have other talks in the meeting here. CDCL. Uh, conflict-driven clause learning solvers, their most successful methods for satisfiability. Um, these modern solvers use this sort of non-implicational reasoning. They infer formulas that don't follow logically from the assumptions. 
a simple example would be pure literal in inference, where if a literal occurs only positively, you can assume it's true without loss of generality. But there's more complex ones as well. There's a variety of systems that have names like BC for block clause, RAT for resolution asymmetric topology, PR for propagation redundancy, and so on. There's the deletion version where you stick a D on the front. Um, these things are all known to be polynomial equivalent to extended Frege, and they hold out the hope that maybe we can get some of the power of extended Frege implemented efficiently, effectively, and to good to do good results in CDCL. Um, so far, it's most more of a hope, although there's been some isolated successes. I must say satisfaction-driven clause learning has um, enabled, been very successful at finding more or less optimal proof, proofs of the pigeon principle of the more or less optimal and well, I don't know if it's optimal or not, but the best I know is n cubed for these kind of things. And that's about what they get in practice, albeit it takes exponential time to find the proofs of length n cubed, but still a good step. And succeeds for pigeons up to uh, systems with over 50 pigeons, which is remarkable. Right? Without this, it's like 13 pigeons, and then you, you hit a brick wall. Uh, and I was actually surprised. Yaakov last week mentioned the MaxSat systems. Uh, Maria and I and other co authors have worked on MaxSat methods and achieved similar success with the visual principle, solving the visual principle up to uh, about 50 plus pigeons, right? A nice looking growth rate and so on. And Yaka pointed out that it's still that the, the way these max sat solvers work, at least some of them, it is a form of extension that's going in under the hood inside the max sat solver. So that's an interesting observation. Okay. Anyway, in the interest of time, I'm going to end up with one set of results off that Tony was involved in. Um, the ideal proof system, somehow I shouldn't go so close to the top and bottom of my slides there. Okay, we'll have, just have to slide around. Um, so this was Josh Grochow and Tony Plassi worked on just in the last few years. This is a static algebraic proof system where an IPS proof is an algebraic circuit, meaning in this case, let's just think over the, over the reals, but with constants for zero and one, such that C of inputs X and a vector of zeros evaluates to the zero polynomial and C of a, the same X and then a vector of pol polynomials evaluates to one. So this is a proof that the Fs can't all be simultaneously equal to zero. And it's not quite a cook reckhouse system because it uses a randomized polynomial time verification algorithm instead of a deterministic one, but close enough. And so it's a polynomial identity testing or PIT. And the theorem here is that IPS polynomially simulates extended Frege. It was on my picture from the beginning, right? And uh, how is this relevant otherwise for extended Frege is if extended Frege proves the correctness of the so-called PIT axioms, quote unquote, for some polynomial size Boolean circuits. So let me say, if we know there's a randomized polynomial time al algorithm, then there's poly size circuits. So if we could somehow identify those poly size circuits, well, the, the dumb thing to do would be to stick axioms into extended Frege to say these circuits are correct. But the better thing to do is to to use some very minimal set of axioms, which they identified, and then said, if extended Frege proves these minimal set of axioms about PIT evaluation circuits, then extended Frege is polynomial equivalent to IPS. And these minimal set of axioms are written at the bottom of the slide, rather small print, because you're not really expected to understand them on the fly, but let me just say them very loosely. Uh, the first axiom says, if you substitute a zero polynomial for the uh, I'm sorry, if, if you substitute a constant into the zero pol pol polynomial, it's still the zero polynomial. The second one says that uh, you can't have both a circuit computing the, that's the one, pol the one polynomial and the zero polynomial at the same time, uh, by which I mean C and one minus C aren't both the zero. The third one says if you substitute a zero polynomial for a constant zero appearing in a zero pol pol polynomial, the result is a zero polynomial. And the fourth one says if you permute the variables of a zero pol polynomial, it's a zero polynomial. All pretty simple, simplistic facts. And if you had those, axiom proven with extended Frege, that's enough to bootstrap your way up to extended Frege is equivalent to IPS. Yeah. Good question. I mean, it would suffice to prove it in a slight proof. Um, 
Yeah, if the circuits were un uniformly generated, you could prove this an S1 too, right? I mean, what's up? Tony, do you want to? If you prove these axioms in S1, then you could. It's better to prove it in S1 too, it's easier. Yeah, so if you could prove S1 too, and of course, the, 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 the sort of first idea here would be well, there's there's a circuit, there's a randomized circuit that computes this with high probability. So if you set the constants correctly, ta, ta, da, you have a circuit, right? Then how do you set the constants correctly? That's probably some kind of counting R argument. So you're probably pulling in the weak pigeon principle. So you're probably sitting at T22 instead of S12. And I have no idea what that would do to any of this stuff. If that worked, if that worked. S12 is part of it's I don't know. Usually, it's better to prove something in S1 rather than trying to find two things. Yeah. So, Pavel's comment, I don't think people can hear it. Pavel's comment says it's better to prove things in S1 too than in an extended bracket because A, you just give one proof and you're done, and B, it's like you have more, more conceptual things you can reason with. It's often easier to reason in S1 too than propositional logic that's come up in Tony's work, for instance, too. That's so, right. so, so so, so, so yeah. if the H is and P then have those that works. Yeah, yeah. It's if if if, uh, if if PIT is provably in P Probably. in S12, then this certainly works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you still need the, the proof to get extended freight equal to IPS, you need the provably part because it could be provably, it could be true, but since extended freight doesn't prove it, it can't it still can't simulate IPS. <laughs> and uh, and then the other thing that came out of whoops. Oh boy, how that happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to see that yet. <laughs> I'm near the end, though. You can see that. <laughs> and I'll pretty much out of time. So, if, the other thing that was that uh, Tony and her co author showed that if um, IPS is not polynomially bounded, then DNP <coughs> is not equal to DNP. Another way to say it is the permanent doesn't have polynomial size algebraic circuits. Which is conjectured that they're unequal as far as I know, but it's also viewed as a very hard problem to solve, right? So, uh, as a corollary, if the extended Frege has polynomial size with PIT axioms of the type we just discussed, and if the extended Frege is not pol pol polynomially bounded, then BP is not equal to the BNP. And why is that relevant? That's my last slide. Here it is. Uh, Tony and Josh argued this may explain why lower bounds for extended Frege are. Hard to attain because they would imply also resolving problems about very hard problems for algebraic circuits. Yeah, Tony was doubtful if I'm on this stage or stuff. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Um, I mean, the other possibility, I guess, is that it just you could just show that the PIT axioms aren't true or something like that, right? <laughs> so, but okay, but it's still just a connection back to the right? And now you see my picture. <laughs> Sure. Happy birthday. <laughs> Wonderful, uh, Sam. Uh, so uh, we have uh, time for questions. We've had, uh, this is, uh, there are a lot of questions, I think, uh, even more than we have answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tony, oh, you've got a mic, you see. Mm -hmm. yes. So I thought it was great you brought up lots of problems, that, old problems, that maybe are solvable. Many people don't know about. So like one was uh, about perm you know, adding subst permutation substitution. Um, and then the other one is uh, maybe you didn't mention it, but lower size bounds for like Frege or extended Frege. I think you have the best results there. Uh, Do you know if that's... Uh, those are still happening? the best. So the, the, the theorem is... Um, you can get quadratic lower bounds on the number of symbols in Frege or extended Frege proof of some rather dumb formulas of the form. I, uh, you, know, you know, so it'd be false and false and false and false. No, sorry, sorry. Let's try that again. False or false or false or false or true nested from with the or true down at the bottom. And so the trouble is the shortest proof of that has to unwind that formula to get to the true. So that takes, in Frege you have a, uh, a minimum of n squared symbols in the proof. And that's our best lower bound of the number of symbols in Frege. And the same thing we should hold for 
I guess for extended, well, for extended frame, you're actually going to prove that formula. You've got to form it. So it also takes sense. So for instance. like CNFs, there's no. Or our small width CNFs, for instance, nothing is known, right? Yeah. Some sort of linear sign. So basically, you have to look at every subformula of the formula you're proving. And that was also the type of method that we used for the paper on the hardness of finding the shortest groups. So these things had simple, very simple, slightly longer proofs. The question is whether there's a shorter proof that takes advantage of a small minimum satisfying assignment. So you unwind less of the formula to get to the lower truths on the inside. Um, after you basically killed uh, most of your own candidates for separating Frege and extended Frege, what's your intuition, your current intuition about uh, what the principle should have to be a viable candidate? Well, that's a good question. I mean, what, what should accept, separate Frege from extended Frege? I mean, I'm lacking good examples. And which makes me nervous. And so maybe I still think that maybe we should go back and someone else more confident than me should try to prove that Frege quasi polynomial is polynomially simulates extended Frege. So one thing that the, the approach I took was the, the second proof of the pigeon principle. I first proved it has polynomial size, and almost 30 years later, I proved it had quasi polynomial size and still managed to get the worst result published 30 years later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the point was. The, the second proof used ST connectivity and graph re, re, reachability and graphs. So the idea would be maybe a short extended Frege proof. There's some sort of property about reaching paths through the extended Frege proof that you could somehow say a short extended Frege proof is proving more than just the formula is true. It's something about the structure of the subformulas or something of that type. But I never can make it work. So. It seems, I mean, I didn't read the whole list, but uh, it seems that the, the most of these examples are really in NC2, or many of these examples yeah, are in NC2. NC2. So quasi-polynomial, maybe it's not so, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, I didn't say this, I meant to say it earlier, the, the linear algebra examples all depend on determinants, and determinants are computable in NC2, and what Hrubas and Samaret showed was that, in fact, the properties of determinants could be expressed and proved in a Frege system using quasi-polynomial size proofs, using NC2 definitions. So, Robert? Uh, okay, good. Yeah, so I guess my question is about the IT axioms actually. So I mean, maybe you can't do it in this one too, but maybe if you equip the system with like some sort of approximate counting, like in APC or something. Yeah, maybe APC or APC, a APC one or two might be able to do that. Um, I, I said T22 earlier, but a APC one or a APC two are contained in that theory. And yeah, maybe they could prove the existence of circuits for PIT, polynomial size, but I don't see, so then, Okay, good question. Maybe something like ML Eurotics system exactly. WF could, could simulate IPS. That had not occurred to me before. That's a, that's, that's a great point. I, I don't think we know how to show that the PAT is in P slash poly, even in P2. Well, it requires al algebraic properties, of course, right? Yeah. Where's the, the short simple lemma, which I don't think is formalizable at this moment. Oh, okay. So Albert's comment says people maybe can't hear it online is the Schwartz Zippel lemma is required for the proof of PIT being having poly size circuits, and we don't know how to formalize this at the moment. Okay, well, thanks for thank you for a wonderful talk and great conversation. The uh,